Hi, good evening everybody and welcome to the second portion of our scoliosis uh, talk. Today we're going to be discussing adult spinal deformity, its causes, symptoms, and treatments. I'm Dr. Pavel Jankowski and I'm a neurosurgeon here at Hoag who specializes in adult and pediatric spinal deformities. So I thought we'd start off first by going over some of the very basics about terminology and what exactly we classify scoliosis. Uh, scoliosis, um, by definition, according to uh, spinal deformity surgeons, is a asymmetry when one is looking in the anterior posterior plane that is greater or equal to 10 degrees. Uh, it can either arise from a pre-existing condition in adolescence, uh, which is most commonly uh, referred to as adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, the most common cause of scoliosis. Um, it can also be attributed to congenital or neuromuscular causes, which is less common. Then, later on in life, it can arise from de novo, which is due to degenerative or iatrogenic causes. So here we have uh, an example of the planes. And when discussing um, scoliosis, it's important to also uh, be very clear as far as in what plane we're having the discussion about. So the picture that is furthest there on your left, you can see an example of what lordosis is, um, with the arrow pointing to the lower lumbar spine in an arch. Then the picture in the middle refers to a kyphosis. So this is what classically we refer to as a hunch. Um, and you can see that uh, hunched back um, in the middle of um, the model there. Then on the far right, we have the uh, example of a scoliosis. And as you can notice here, when we're talking about lordosis and kyphosis, we're discussing um, the lateral plane of the patient. When we're referring to scoliosis, we are now shifting into the anterior posterior plane. This slide here further uh, builds on that. So the uh, figure here is cut into three planes. So starting from the plane that is going through the middle half of the patient um, is the axial plane. That's the plane that when we're looking at going from top to bottom. Then the plane that bisects the person going from front to back is the, referred to as the sagittal plane. This, another term for this, is the lateral plane. Then the um, plane that bisects the patient going from right to left is the coronal plane or the anterior posterior plane. These planes here, again, I put next to one another to refer to. So when we are discussing lordosis or kyphosis, we are looking at the picture in the sagittal plane. When we're looking at scoliosis, we are looking at the patient through the coronal plane. When we talk about scoliosis, it is important to always be thinking in a three-dimensional uh, structure. And sometimes this is a little bit harder to conceptualize, but this figure here puts this a little bit more into perspective. When scoliosis is happening, it's not just a mere bend of the spine in one direction, as we see it on an x-ray. We have to remember that in an x-ray, we are looking at the spine in two dimensions. Our spine, as the rest of us, is a three-dimensional entity. So we can see here with the diagram that is on the right side, when we begin to deform the cylinder, we are also not only bending it in one direction, but we're also imparting on it a curvature. This is the three-dimensional rotation that a scoliotic spine undergoes, and which is why there's changes in the sagittal and the coronal plane at the same time. And this is why many times when there is a deformation, the deformity can exist concomitantly in the sagittal and coronal plane. So let's first take a look at this um, picture here. So this is a patient who has a scoliosis and we're looking at the patient again in the coronal plane and we are looking at the uh, patient from the back to the front. This is how uh, when we're taking long cassette films, that's how the patient should be positioned. And we can see here the bend in his back. The next refers to the sagittal plane. So when the patient now stands up, we can see that he is slightly tilted forward, and we can also see on our spine that there's a flattening effect. Finally, when we look at the patient bending forward, we can see the true nature of the deformity. And 
when, you, when we look at the diagram here on the left-hand side, the reason for that is the rotation. So this is the rotation that is happening from the picture that I was showing earlier, but it also is producing a deformity in the coronal and sagittal plane. So here, when we're discussing this, a uh, patient of, of mine from earlier this year who has a scoliosis, and when we refer to this, this is a coronal plane deformity. It's also fair to assume, uh, which this is not pictured here, but the patient also had a significant sagittal plane deformity. This is an example of a patient with kyphosis, or also flat back symptom. And again, we are looking at the patient through the sagittal plane, or otherwise known as the lateral plane. When we get older in life, what matters most to us uh, is our ergonomic posture. And the ideal alignment that we are trying to strive for is for the head to be positioned over the femoral heads, or another way of looking is over the pelvic joints. And this concept, which was developed by a French surgeon, Claude Dubousset, is referred to as the cone of economy. And imagine that the spinal pelvic balance in the sagittal plane is an open linear chain linking the head to the pelvis. We can see here on our diagram um, on the right-hand side that when there's a deviation of the head either forward or backwards over the pelvis, there's a process that then ensues, which then leads to the acceleration of the pain cascade. The Dubousset cone of economy concept is important in maintaining upright posture and most importantly, minimizing energy expenditure when we are upright. When a deformity progresses, it is this increased energy expenditure that results in significant pain and disability. The incidence of adult spinal deformity is becoming more common. Common causes of pain and disability in the 60 and older age group and also we are seeing that as people get older, the incidence and prevalence of adult spinal deformity is increasing. In a study that was uh, performed in 2006 by randomly sampling community volunteers between the ages of 50 and 84, and then following them for 12 years, scoliosis developed in 22 of the subjects, 37%. Predictors that were mentioned in the study uh, that were risk factors were greater than 20% decrease in unilateral disc height, greater than five millimeters longer osteophytes on one side. Osteophytes in this case are, refer are otherwise known as bone spurs. This graph here shows the trend in the population in the United States. So we can see here the projection uh, that when we, when we move out past 2020, the percentage of patients that are age 60 and above increases. And this is something that we're well aware of, that we are living longer and healthier lives. Unfortunately, though, our spines continue to undergo degenerative processes. And as these degenerative processes progress into our older age, scoliosis becomes a big uh, factor in this. In a study performed by Schwab in 2005, volunteers aged 60 and above with no known history of scoliosis or um, previous spine surgeries were, were uh, shown to have 68% that met the definition criteria of scoliosis, which is a Cobb angle of greater than 10 degrees, as mentioned previously in our slide. So in terms of adult spinal deformity, it's mostly related to the sagittal plane. There's little correlation between coronal deformity and self-reported disability. Again, so this goes back to the cone of economy that when patients were asked what their level of pain, this had a greater correlation to the deformity being present from the lateral to sagittal plane. A scoliosis, which in this case is the coronal plane, didn't have as high incidence of reporting of disability and pain. It still can be, and as mentioned before, you can find both of them commonly in one patient. A common feature of adult spinal deformity is an increasingly recognized cause of pain and associated with disability and poor quality of life. The way that we describe adult spinal deformity is through a classification score. This was de developed over a decade ago, and the purpose of this was in order to faci facilitate communication between physicians and also guide treatment guidelines for surgeries in these patients. We can see here in the boxes mentioned, first is uh, we describe what type of curve this is.
if the deformity is present when looking at the patient from the coronal plane in the thoracic, the thoracolumbar lumbar region, or if there's a double curve, or if there's no major coronal deformity. The boxes that are on the right-hand side refer to the compensation mechanisms that the spine undergoes in order to maintain upright posture. And we classify this based on the severity of these compensation mechanisms. The greater the compensation mechanism, the greater the deformity and the greater the disability and level of pain. Some causes of degenerative scoliosis in adults are the following. Primarily, degenerative causes. As we um, alluded to slightly previously, um, as patients age, the spine undergoes natural wear and tear. These natural wear and tear can be tolerated to a certain extent, but in the end, also can lead to changes morphologically in the spine. That includes degeneration of the discs, which involves asymmetrical uh, disc height loss. Discs don't degenerate uh, uniformly uh, throughout the spine. There can be increased degeneration either on the left or the right, and depending on which side that is, it can lead to an asymmetry of the spine and transition into a scoliosis. Spondylosis refers to the arthritic type of changes that uh, the discs undergo and the joints. Then there's further facet joint arthropathy when there's a, uh, further acceleration and sometimes inflammation of the joint spaces due to the arthritis processes. Other causes include metabolic. This is osteopenia and osteoporosis, especially very commonly seen in women above the age of 60. Iatrogenic causes, previous spine surgeries, flat back deformity that are induced from other procedures, and then finally trauma, tumor, and infection, which are less common causes. So let's go delve into some examples and further illustration of degenerative causes. So here's a patient from my clinic who again presented with two forms of deformities. We can see here on the left hand side picture, patient who has a deformity in the sagittal plane, the numbers in red refer to the scale that I mentioned previously. And we can see that the picture on the right um, showing that the patient has a significant curvature in the coronal plane. If we were to classify this for brevity's sake, we will say that the patient has a coronal curve in the uh, thoracolumbar region, so that gives um, the patient an L. As far as the modification that the patient has, um, it gives them a plus for the um, PI minus LL, which is at 19.9 degrees. Their global alignment exceeds 10 centimeters, so they get a plus plus and their pelvic tilt compensation uh, is also at a plus plus. So the patient will be classified as an L plus 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 plus. This is the patient in real life. Uh, we can see that the nature of the deformity again with the patient standing to the side and from behind. Again, very important to, when looking at this to take into account and think in three dimensions. The spine is not merely being bent in one direction, it is being twisted and in so doing, imparting deformity in both the coronal and sagittal plane. Sources of pain in this kind of a patient and in the scoliotic spine can be further shown here. So we can see a normal spine and then a spine which had scoliosis imparted on it. We can see stretching, shortening of muscles along with lengthening. Then, in the figure on the right-hand side, we see vital areas that come under attack from the generation. We can see our disc space, which begins to shrink, and eventually with accelerated degeneration, air accumulates in there. That, in turn, leads to modic-type changes in the end plates of the vertebral bodies, which is a source of pain. We see also in the back, when looking at the figure, the joint spaces. So you can see here the zygopophyseal joint or facet joint, as it's also called, is an area where the arthritic processes begins to develop. And with the loss of the soft materials and the ligaments and structures that provide for lubrication, that leads to inflammatory changes and therefore pain. We also, what we don't have pictured here from the side view is the muscles. The muscles which undergo atrophy um, in later age attach to these bony landmarks, 
and with the degeneration, there is more pressure that is then imparted on the disc spaces and the facet joints, which are not adapt to handle these changes. Osteoporosis, very common cause of deformity. And we can see here a, a similar, a same patient with, who has already a compression fracture in the base of their thoracic spine. And then a picture taken nine months later showing further progression of the deformity due to new fractures present in the mid-thoracic region. We can see the significance of this in this diagram. Iatrogenic deformity is deformity that is made by, other, by surgeons and us in the medical community from procedures. One of the most common causes and what led to uh, uh, study and development of new treatment guidelines for adult deformity came out of studying and looking at patients that had undergone Harrington rod surgery after World War II. After World War II, Harrington rods um, became vital in treating adolescent idiopathic scoliosis and other scoliosis by either stabilizing or correcting the deformity in the coronal plane. But again, in thinking about this in a three-dimensional setting, which was not done at that time, what was not known to us is that we were now inducing a new deformity in the sagittal plane. So you can see here in the diagram, the patient who has their spine straightened at the base also has a complete flattening of that spine and a tilting forward effect. But here's an example of another patient who was treated via Harrington rod surgery and the flat back and sagittal plane deformity that was then uh, imparted on the patient after the treatment later in life. When something like this is seen, it will require another surgery and an osteotomy in order to correct the spine and reorient it in the proper alignment. Trauma, not as a common cause, but also can contribute to a deformity. Um, here, this is a uh, severe type of a fracture that led to a spinal cord injury. And you can see here the kyphosis that's imparted from the uh, traumatic event. Tumor and infection, also less common, but can lead to uh, significant deformity. This is an example of an infection that led to accelerated um, pathological fracture and kyphosis in the sagittal plane. Infections like to start off from the disc spaces and then spread elsewhere. Tumors will typically involve the bone and spread out from there. One of the most common questions I get in my practice is progression of curves. Patients many times are aware that they've had a scoliosis and have been living with it uh, for some time up until they come and see me. And at that point, uh, their pain and their disability has progressed. But the question that they ask then, well, how worried should I be about this? Can I just go on living in pain? Will this eventually just stop? And the question to that is, is no, curves do progress. We have very good clinical evidence that have followed patients out with these type of deformities and we know that these curves are not stagnant and that they, that they do evolve. And the reason for that is we'll go dive into here in the next slides. They're multifactorial. They have to do with the quality of the bone, the quality of the muscle, all factors that undergo degeneration as we age and therefore lead to the scoliosis progressing. We can see here an example of this in one patient and um, uh, with pictures taken at 33 years of age, 50 and 55, and the clear progression of the deformity over this time frame. Here is a graph that was taken uh, from the Spine Journal that also followed patients. And we can see in charting these patients who had thoracic curves or thoracolumbar lumbar curves and the progression again over time. The rough estimate that I provide to my patients is that curves can progress anywhere from one to three degrees. However, there can be other circumstances which can accelerate this process, especially if there's been significant changes in the patient's state of health, their bone quality, muscle mass, and other health-related issues. Some of these causes include biomechanical changes in the disc, degenerative processes in the joint spaces, structural instabilities that arise from these, decreased bone mass, 
and loss of muscle mass known as sarcopenia. In this picture, we can see the degenerative changes that undergo in an aging spine. The x-ray picture on the left-hand side shows a subtle scoliosis. We can see the bone spurs that accumulate. We see the asymmetrical loss of height in the vertebral bodies on one side versus the other. And we can also see the asymmetrical loss of disc height. Bones are constantly undergoing a regeneration and degeneration process that is performed by the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts in the bones. When this is happening, though, it doesn't happen in a symmetrical fashion, but can also happen in an asymmetrical fashion and therefore leads to the picture that we see on the left-hand side. Loss of bone mass, very well known and still in our country significantly undertreated. Um, and underdiagnosed, especially in our community here in Orange County. Females, especially after menopause, undergo an accelerated degeneration of bone mass and should be monitored on a regular basis. That's why uh, women after the age of 60 should have a DEXA scan performed on a regular basis. Men also are at risk of losing bone mass, but much less so due to the difference in hormones. Loss of muscle mass, sarcopenia as I referred to, also significantly underdiagnosed, especially in studies in, um, in women after the age of 60. In studies that have been performed in the last five to 10 years, we have seen that in women of this age group, there undergoes not only a degeneration of the paraspinal muscles that are shown here in the figure, but also their replacement with fat. This fat, um, provides little stability for the spine and again imparts increased mechanical forces on the disc spaces, on the joints, the ligaments, and other structures that provide stability for our spine. So what are the clinical signs and symptoms in adult degenerative scoliosis? First and foremost is pain. So in a sample of patients that have been um, asked about what their number one um, complaint is 85% will uh, mention pain. Back pain in the area of the curvature is due to the de degree of disc degeneration, the facet arthritic processes, the rotation and subluxation along with listhesis. In the medical terminology, listhesis is referred to as a movement. So if we take two blocks on, on top of each other and we move that block either forward or backwards, that's what it refers to an anterior or posterior listhesis. If we move it from side to side, we're talking about a lateral listhesis. And finally, muscle fatigue. Another symptom that we can observe is radicular pain. Here in this diagram, we see a disc fragment that is pinching up against a nerve. Radicular pain can be related to disc degeneration and protrusions and imparting pressure effect on the nerve, but it can also be due to um, other types of degenerative processes that are constricting the outflow of the nerve, putting pressure on it. Finally, neurogenic claudication, secondary to these degenerative changes, which causes pressure on the spinal canal, can lead um, to symptoms of its own. Neurogenic claudication can mimic sagittal plane deformity, and the treatment for it is significantly different, different than treating a spinal deformity. Here's an example of a patient with spinal stenosis that can mimic a, a sagittal plane deformity. Patients typically that have neurogenic claudication will bend forward because that relieves many of the um, symptoms that they're having. And there's difficulty walking longer distances, a heaviness in the legs, pain and tingling, numbness. These should be carefully distinguished from a true sagittal plane deformity. So how do we go about evaluating patients? First and foremost, as in any um, patient setting, is to get a good history, especially regarding the pain. Onset of pain, the duration of the pain, does the pain radiate anywhere? Is it confined primarily to the lower back? Does it travel into the hips? Does it go down past the hips, to the knees, and into the feet? Has the patient undergone any type of previous procedures? Has there been any trauma related, especially in the recent years? Uh, the next, we want to also know a good uh, description of the patient's past medical history. Does the patient have diabetes, which can lead to peripheral neuropathy, 
troubles with balance? Does the patient have history of tobacco use? Smoking is very closely linked to osteopenia and osteoporosis. Malnutrition also can accelerate osteopenia and osteoporotic processes. We already talked about the osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease. This is important if a patient is a candidate for surgery and if there needs to be any kind of prehabilitation to make them ready. What was their activity level before the onset of the scoliosis and afterwards? Again, as mentioned previously, back pain is the most common symptom. 60% of patients over the, year, over the age of 60 have back pain. Spinal deformity is common and seen in 68% over the age of 65. But again, not all deformity is painful and not all pain has, as can be linked with deformity. So most importantly is one needs to be looking at the patient and treating the patient and the symptoms instead of radiographic findings. When we assess the patient radiologically, it is important to get accurate imaging in order to be able to describe the deformity in detail. This is done by taking full length standing x-rays that image the patient's skull all the way down to their feet. And we can see an example of this with the x-ray machine which should be taken from behind the patient looking forward and then from the side with the hands on the clavicles. Um, the hips and knees here are fully extended and the patient is asked to stand in a natural posture um, as they would on a regular basis. There can be no external supports for the patient to hang on to during this process. New technology that has emerged in the past decade involves the EOS machine, which will be coming to Hoag later this year. This is a 10 camera radio imaging suite that the patient steps into and imparts one tenth the radiation of standard x-rays and also is significantly faster. Other films that are evaluated during the process of um, characterization of the deformity include flexion and extension to establish if there is any abnormal motion, then traction bolster films, which are used to de uh, describe if the scoliosis and deformity can be reduced when the patient is laying supine, um, MRI, which allows us to evaluate the neurological elements and determine what level of compression slash stenosis is present. CT is very useful um, and even more helpful for evaluating osteopenia and loss of bone mass in the spine more than a DEXA scan. Also shows us previous um, procedures, planning of instrumentation. And as I mentioned, the DEXA scan, which is, should be done on a routine basis, but is not the most accurate descriptor of true bone quality. One has to remember that in a DEXA scan, the samples are taken from multiple points of the body and sometimes can emit the spine entirely. This radiographic evaluation is used to then analyze the spine and using the Schwab SRS classification scales I mentioned to previously helps us to define what the nature of the deformity is and what the compensation mechanisms are and what needs to be done to adequately correct the deformity surgically. Let's now delve into treatments. In the previous lecture, we discussed treatments a bit more in detail, especially diving into the surgical treatments. For the purposes of this lecture, we will instead focus more on some of the non-surgical treatments and an, just a broad overview of surgery. So first and foremost, prior to uh, surgery being considered, is non-surgical treatments should be tried first. Many times, patients have not had any form of conservative management. Um, when they arrive, and many times also aren't always knowledgeable what the best type of non-surgical treatments are. It is difficult to evaluate how effective, though, conservative or non-surgical treatments can be. This is because the patient can have a severe form of deformity, which may not be amenable or may make them incapable of participating in conservative management. Therefore, multiple variables are considered before deciding what the best form of treatment uh, should be. Sometimes, if the deformity and the disability is severe, the patient does need to proceed first with surgery. Uh, Non-surgical treatments start off with physical therapy. The purpose of physical therapy, in particular, is not only to promote motion, which allows for blood circulation, 
which allows for adequate uh, bone turnover and strengthening of bone. When looking at what was one of the biggest deterrents of osteopenia and osteoporosis in studies performed in the elderly, uh, motion and activity was the best predictor of success. Weight-bearing exercises, which further promote um, healthy bone turnover. Then next is stabilization of core muscles. So the muscles in the abdomen and in the lower back paraspinal region. The purpose of this being is to offset the pressure that they impart on the joint spaces and on the disc spaces. After uh, physical therapy and during the process, if the patient is having severe level of pain, if the, especially if that level of pain is either lower back pain or radicular pain, they can be evaluated and determine if they're a candidate for injections. These injections can be administered in different locations. If the patient is primarily complaining of radicular pain related to compression on a nerve, then epidural injections can be administered. If the patient is uh, endorsing primarily low back pain, facet um, joint injections or nerve ablations or facet blocks can be performed. One thing that's key to mention, going back to the injection slide, is that injections are not, in, are not without risk. Many times I'll have patients that show up in my clinic and will have had multiple injections throughout the course of the year. It is important to have an honest discussion with your pain provider and understand how many injections are planned because again, their injections do come with a certain risk. Hypertension um, can be exacerbated in patients who are suffering from hypertensive disease. Also, people who have diabetes can cause a significant increase in their blood glucose levels that can be longer lasting. Furthermore, there's degeneration from the injection medications that are administered on the joint spaces and on the surrounding tissue structures. Now, going into surgery. I'd say that in the past 10 years, there has been significant advances in how we approach spinal deformity in patients. As uh, was shown previously during the times of the Harrington rods, we did not have the level of knowledge that we do first and foremost in characterizing deformities. We did not understand also that the level of deformity progresses throughout life, that there is deformity not only in the coronal plane but also in the sagittal plane. Since then, by gaining this knowledge, we have been better able to also plan for these procedures, which has led to the advent of planning programs and softwares that can be used by surgeons um, to characterize deformities accurately and then put together the appropriate surgical plan. Preoperative preparation also has improved significantly. Many times we, didn't, we did not understand the effect of these variables in the success of patients undergoing deformity procedures. Nutrition is a key factor of this. Many times, especially in patients above the age of 60, the ability to take in a healthy diet and also extract the proper nutrients from that is diminished. Therefore, many times in my clinic, patients will undergo nutrition consult and determine if they need to augment their uh, nutrition in a particular way. Pulmonary status can also be impacted. And it's not uncommon for patients to have some form of a restriction in their lung function um, into the um, elder years. Cardiac function also. All of these things need to be screened for and evaluated. And if surgery is contemplated, need to be prepared for or corrected prior to. As, as I briefly mentioned, some of these advances that we have seen include the preoperative planning softwares, augmented reality, and navigation tools that now are in place, um, which includes also robotics, um, artificial intelligence sy systems, and predictive analytics will be a huge component in this uh, field leading into the near future. We are already using some of these systems to help plan surgeries and describe what will happen to the area of the spine that is not operated on. Being able to pr predict these changes is very key. Real-time neurological monitoring also is now employed, something that I use on a routine basis in my cases.
Um, this is performed by a qualified neuromonitoring um, practitioner um, who is monitoring the signals from the brain through the spinal cord out to the nerves. In case there is any type of changes, it can be corrected immediately. Advances in spinal implants continues to evolve. Our ability to make implants that are longer lasting, that are resistant to different types of failures that can happen, and also that can make our lives as the surgeons more effective in treating deformities. And as previously described, the preoperative preparation can't be stressed enough. The goals of the surgery are to restore a harmonious sagittal and coronal plane alignment. And again, reverting back to the cone of economy here, is to improve the patient's balance on an everyday basis. And here we can see here um, some of the specific measurements that we use in order to help realign the patient. The purpose of this is to reduce the compensatory mechanisms, which again are a huge contributor to the pain, restore original curve type, and achieve a global harmonious balance. Surgery is complex. So risks are definitely present. Um, according to the literature, these risks can be substantial. However, it is also important to um, stress that overall, according to um, two studies mentioned here and in others, surgical treatment has been shown to be associated with a greater chance of achieving clinical improvement and compared to conservative treatment for patients with ASD more effective. Thank you very much for your attention and we'll open it up to some questions at this point. The first question is, do you recommend off-the-shelf scoliosis braces? I had my DEXA scan and can see where it needs to be straightened. I believe that was um, um, x-ray. Um, in terms of bracing, this is a good question. Um, the technology of bracing has not evolved over the past 20 years much. We have um, only a few standardized braces. The LSO, which is the lumbar spine orthotic, is used for the lower back. When uh, we are dealing with uh, sagittal plane, coronal plane deformities, we typically employ a TLSO, which is a thoracolumbar spine orthotic. And sometimes for cervical thoracic deformities, we will be using either a halo or a SOMI brace. A SOMI brace is essentially a hard, rigid cervical collar attached to a thora thoracic rigid collar. Therefore, these braces do not immobilize the spine that much. They also do not correct the deformity in any way. Um, bracing, which is employed in the pediatric population, is also applied for curves that only reach a certain level of degrees. Beyond that, it has been shown in the Iowa brace study that they're not effective. Therefore, a brace, when used in adults, should primarily be used for mitigation of pain. It's not going to correct the deformity, and it's not going to prevent the deformity from progressing. So if there is a brace that is comfortable for you to use and it's effective in alleviating the pain, then I would say it's fine to use. But again, understanding that it should be done so under the guidance of a spine surgeon and a scoliosis professional. Can I sit, next question is, can I sit on an uneven surface to help counteract the minor scoliosis curve in my lumbar region? I often sit with my right foot under my left buttock that I'm guessing curved it in the first place. So in this particular case, this was, uh, goes back to the question that patients sometimes ask me. When I was young, I carried my backpack on one shoulders. And back in my day, I had to carry 50 pounds of books. And the answer to that is, is that that most likely is not a reason why the scoliosis developed. There has been a little bit of research into this and in showing that it certainly can cause tightening and, le and lengthening of muscles around the spine, which may or may not have an effect. However, scoliosis cannot be exacerbated with a postural change, especially in a sitting position. When we do sit and stand and lay down, the spine takes on completely different shapes. Um, so most important is what I always advocate to my patients 
is good activity level, looking at strengthening the core and the paraspinal regions, and to sit in a way that is comfortable for one. Well, obviously, we should try to avoid slouching forward um, when sitting down and to maintain the back as upright as possible. Also important is when working in front of a computer. Um, many times, if we have the, um, the possibility of working in front of a desktop, then we should have the screen positioned at least at eye level or slightly above so that we are not hunching forward. Um, laptops are particularly uh, dangerous in this setting because in laptops, our level of gaze is directed downwards and it involves typically with our shoulders being rolled forward and hunching of our back, which can then lead to neck pain, shoulder pain, and also lower back pain. Next question, what's the best way to follow up with Hogue Health Spinal Group? Through my PCP, whom would I be referred to? So some of you uh, may have not uh, may have been made aware, but from now over the past six months um, with the launch of the um, Hogue Spine Institute, there has been also new resources put in place to help direct patients um, to get the best type of care. Sometimes if there is a spinal pathology that is not known to be scoliosis and is back pain, uh, the uh, patient will be referred by the network. That can be either their primary care provider or the spine nurse navigator. And this, what the role of the spine nurse navigator is, is to get an intake questionnaire from the patient and to find out what the patient is suffering from and to direct them to the most qualified surgeon at that time. So you can also ask to be seen by any one of our providers, by either myself or one of my colleagues, that is a Hogue-affiliated spine professional. Next question. If someone had spinal surgery for scoliosis, will the curve still progress over time or at a more slower rate? Uh, great question. So this is the concept that is known as adding on. Um, this becomes particularly important when uh, treating pediatric scoliosis um, and is something that is taken into account um, when designing the type of surgery to be performed and to make sure that a, sc that a scoliosis doesn't develop in other parts of the spine. In adults, the type of scoliosis that can develop after treatment is different. So one of the biggest risks of this is what's known as proximal junctional kyphosis. Um, and this is a hunching in the sagittal plane above the area of the instrumentation. There are certain mechanisms that can be employed to help mitigate this and decrease the chances of it. Other reasons for this are more complex, which go beyond the scope of this lecture. In my practice, there are particular measures that I take in place since this is always factored in into the surgical planning. So one thing that I employ is to maintain what's called a soft landing above the area of the instrumentation. This can be either done by specific types of hooks or also um, what are cables that are put above, imparts a level of mobility and offsets the rigidity. Then muscle preservation, ligament preservation during the surgery is key. I work closely with a plastic surgeon here at Hogue who helps in closure of the cases and also makes sure that the muscles and soft tissue structures heal as best as possible. So it is something that needs to be carefully considered. Its factors are very multi, uh, multifactorial, um, and, but there are other mechanisms that can be employed to offset this. Again, this has been uh, a very active area of research in this field. Um, we have gained more insight in it in the past several years, but there isn't yet one foolproof plan that can offset this. Next question. I am a female and have Parkinson's 75 years. What about minimally invasive surgery for my back pain? I also have scoliosis. So this is an interesting situation. So Parkinson's disease can impart on it its own type of spinal deformity. So capnocornea, where a patient has a deformity in the, sa in the sagittal plane, 
is something that is related entirely to the Parkinson's disease. And by treating the Parkinson's can help uh, offset this deformity. However, also patients with Parkinson's disease have abnormal pain uh, responses and abnormal pain pathways. Therefore, um, many times they are at increased risk of suffering a greater disability than patients without Parkinson's. I have in my practice um, treated several patients um, and see on a regular basis patients um, that have spine pathologies, scoliosis, and other deformities that also have Parkinson's. And so the reason I was mentioning this, it is very key to get a good history and establish if the patient has a Parkinson's disease that is being treated effectively or needs further treatment. Minimally invasive options do exist, but this also depends on the level and severity of the deformity. Unfortunately, many deformities, if severe, are not amenable to minimally invasive treatments. Minimally invasive treatments can be, um, can be applied, but when compared to open um, surgery treatments are not as effective. Next question is, is there a connection between lower back scoliosis and sciatica? Yes, there is. So in one of the slides that was mentioning as far as the symptoms, I talked about radicular pain. We don't have a model here, but using my two hands here, the way to think about this is when we're looking at a scoliosis, again, in the coronal plane, um, face on, and there is a bend, well, the nerves that are exiting out on the sides of this, when you go ahead and impart a bend off to the right-hand side, you're now going to be closing down the space where the nerve is exiting from the foramen. As you close down the space, you, incre you also increase the pressure on the nerve and therefore uh, can cause radicular type of changes. So the sciatica that one is experiencing from a scoliosis can be attributed to this. Um, as you narrow down this foramen, the degeneration that happens around the canal further imparts pressure and uh, symptoms and disability. So that's all the questions that we have. If there's other questions, I invite you to go ahead and send them in, at which point um, the team here can go ahead and pass them off to me and I will uh, get back to you via email or through my office. Um, also, um, if there's any other types of questions um, regarding consultation, feel free to contact my office, uh, which is in the 16405 Sand Canyon building. Um, and thank you again for your time, and we'll be back again in a few months with another scoliosis lecture. Have a great day. Thank you.